Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 38 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. Today, we are joined again by a special guest, Dr. Stephen Nagy, Asian public policy expert, political science professor, and politics commentator. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random stuff. Here are this week's top news highlights. Japan to begin COVID-19 vaccinations on a reservation basis. Japan to keep tax cuts for home and car buyers to help virus hit economy. Japanese macaques in the mood for love amid flaming reds and yellows of autumn foliage. This week in Japan. All right, so to get us started, our first news item, Japan to begin COVID-19 vaccinations on a reservation basis. Kyoto News has reported that the health ministry released on December 10th that Japan will begin carrying out coronavirus vaccinations at facilities prepared by municipalities using reservation systems that are managed at the local level. The plan was approved by a panel of experts ahead of the potential March start of the country's mass vaccination program. The ministry said it plans to secure 10,500 freezers capable of storing vaccines, allowing them to be distributed across the country. That's a lot of freezers. The ministry said in addition to medical facilities, vaccination should be carried out at public health centers, gymnasiums, event venues, and shopping malls, adding those being administered the vaccine must make a reservation in advance with authorities in the cities, towns, or villages in which they are registered as residents. As the soon-to-be-available COVID-19 vaccines must be stored at low temperatures, the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare will secure about 3,000 freezers with the capacity to store items at minus 75 degrees centigrade and about 7,500 freezers with a minus 20 degrees centigrade capability. It will also procure dry ice and cooler boxes for vaccination centers. You know, when I hear that the vaccinations are going to be carried out by the local municipalities, I think, man, I really need to move to Chiyoda Ward now. Because <laughs> you know they're going to get it first. They've only got like 30,000 residents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully it'll be okay out in Chiba. I don't know, though. I, you're going to be right behind Mickey Mouse and uh, Goofy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Japan to keep tax cuts for home and car buyers to help virus hit economy. Kyoto also reported that Japan's ruling coalition approved a tax reform package for fiscal 2021 on December 10th with planned extensions of tax breaks for home and car purchases to underpin the coronavirus pandemic hit economy. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga's Liberal Democratic Party and its junior coalition partner Komeito also aim to encourage the private sector to work towards carbon reduction and digitization with revisions to corporate taxation. The government is expected to approve tax reform plans for the fiscal year from April based on the ruling party proposals and submit bills related to the package to the ordinary parliamentary session beginning in January. Akira Amari, who heads the LDP's tax commission, said at a press conference that if realized, the reform package will entail state tax cuts worth 50 billion yen, which is about 480 million US dollars. Amadi also stated that, Before it's too late, we need to prepare now for future challenges such as digitalization and carbon reduction through the tax system. Among envisaged incentives for home buyers is an extension of a special tax cut measure for people with housing loans. At present, those who take out housing loans by the end of 2020 are eligible for a 13-year tax reduction rather than the usual 10 years. The ruling parties propose that those who newly sign loan contracts by late 2022 would also receive such treatment. So we've got two years for this tax, potential tax break? Gotta hurry up and buy that house. Yeah, yeah, looks like it. I'll take five. <laughs> 
All right, and our next item, Japanese macaques in the mood for love amid flaming reds and yellows of autumn foliage. The Mainichi has reported that the mating season has begun for wild Japanese macaques who have been seen on dates among the autumn leaves at a zoological facility in Oita Prefecture in western Japan. Apparently, you can tell when these monkeys are ripe for action because their faces and bottoms turn bright red. So, just like humans. Hoo hoo, ha ha. About 1,200 monkeys live on Mount Takasaki, where the Takasakiyama Natural Zoological Garden is located, and visitors can observe wild Japanese macaques up close and personal. The season of monkey love usually lasts until around March followed by a rush of births from May to August. According to the facility, a total of 135 baby macaques were born this year. Reporters attempted to ask one monkey about their mating plans for the season, but the love-hungry monkey refused to be interviewed, stating, Not now, chief. I'm in the zone. You know, I don't see a lot of monkeys, though. Here in Tokyo, Chiba, Saitama... Well, I, I think, you know, they, they want to be left alone in their privacy. But you know, one area where there are a lot of monkeys, you remember uh, Matt Ketchum's been on the program a few times. Mm. He will send me videos and post them to Instagram of the monkeys in Yugawara. They are all over the place. Ah, okay. And they're like terrorists. They will come and, you know, steal your shit and they just go crazy. Wow, wow. So there's clusters of them, obviously. Yes. In these certain areas. And they're not wearing masks. Well, that's not good. All right. Coming up next, we have a special interview with Dr. Stephen Nagy, Asian public policy expert, political science professor, and politics commentator. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Steven, thanks so much for coming back on Tokyo Wave. It's good to be here again. Thanks, guys. So you're originally from Canada and you provide geopolitical analysis on trends in the region to businesses, governments, and the media. And we've also been discussing some of your recent works. And so today I'd like to talk about some of the things that you've been doing recently and the trends that you're seeing around the region as we're going into next year. And there are a lot of new developments like the next United States president and what's going to happen with Prime Minister Suga in the coming months. Well, there's lots on the plate in terms of 2021. And, you know, we still are ha- we're going to have to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, vaccines are a partial solution. In reality, we won't have that deployed um, across the world and in particular in emerging countries, which means we're still going to have to be cautious and wear masks and watch our social distancing. Um, the President Biden's going to be very focused domestically on, on what's happening in the United States, on economic recovery and getting the vaccine out. And of course, we still have the challenges in the region. Um, North Korea will test uh, President Biden in the new year, absolutely. Uh, and I think um, Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the Communist Party in China, is going to test uh, Biden as well. Will he have a handout? And lastly, what will Prime Minister Suga do and how will he keep the economy moving? Um, as you mentioned, these tax cuts and other um, policies, will they really add some value to ordinary Japanese people's lives? And, and that's still an open question. And if it doesn't add value to the average Tanaka or Suzuki, we may see him not be reelected in an, in an upcoming election in 2021. So first and foremost, you are a Canadian and also an expert on Canada-Japan relations. Recently, you published a piece in the Pacific Forum with Brad Glosserman titled Canada-U.S. Relations After Trump, Back to Normal and a Little Bit More. Could you tell us a bit more about how you think the Biden administration will change the international relations dynamic? Well, I think we have to kind of look back and see how the the outgoing president, President Trump, affected not only Canada, but many countries' relations. And I think for the average Canadian, we felt that um, the Trump administration was a bully in terms of dealing with trade and, and negotiating NAFTA 2.0, um, eschewing multilateralism, and in, in particular human rights and, and the, the migration-related issues. These are fundamentally, I guess, against Canadian values. And we felt that, you know, our southern neighbor that we, we rely on, that we know well, that we have family relations, cultural relations, 
um, something went very, very strange. And, and the past four years have been very difficult, I think, for the average Canadian. And going forward on the Biden administration, I think what we're looking forward to is that um, President-elect Biden is an internationalist. He is somebody that supports multilateral institutions. He will likely rejoin the WHO right away. He will likely um, rejoin the Paris Climate Accords. And I think that these are will resonate well with Canadians. But I think that if we're going to be successful in the relationship, Canada needs to step up to the plate and help Biden be successful. And that means, um, you know, put some goods on the table. That means being more proactive in the Indo-Pacific in terms of security and maritime cooperation. It means probably helping um, President Biden with the Build Back Better um, the Biden version of American first. And I think it also means that Canada is going to have to um, work with other middle powers, including Japan and Australia, to really fill the vacuum that I think is going to exist as, as pres- uh, President Biden is, is very focused on on the, the domestic economy and the COVID crisis that is still going to be with the United States in 2021. Yeah, you know, from an American perspective, I'd say the past four years, the only news I heard about from U.S. media concerning Canada was uh, Americans uh, planning on moving to Canada. So I'm curious, you know, <laughs> from a domestic uh, Canadian perspective, how have the last four years kind of been, you know, uh, viewed by the average Canadian? Most Canadians would probably see the harder line on China as being probably something positive. I think that uh, where we really diverge when we see these, when we saw the past four years, I think that we were very shocked with with the tone of politics in the United States, um, the division between the Democrats and the Republicans, and I think how on the far left and far right of of the Republican dep- Democratic continuum, that everything was exaggerated, right? I mean, uh, Bernie Sanders is not a socialist or communist and neither is, is president, uh, former president Obama, but that's how it was kind of articulated. And for the average Canadian, we're going, what if, if president Obama's a communist, I guess we're communists, right? It just didn't make sense, you know, um, taking away our, our, the, the quest to remove Obamacare. It just didn't make sense, right? Because I mean, you know, Canada has a, a national health care problem. It's a program. It's not perfect, but I mean, it works really, really well. Um, and we can see that in in comparing the, the numbers of COVID infectees um, and uh, lifespans and, and, and general access to, to health care. So for many reasons, we kind of just said, what's happening in the, in the United States? So something's gone wrong. And, um, you know, I think that for the average Canadian, and we look back to events like 9-11, where after the Twin Towers were attacked and, and Canada welcomed Americans into Canada, into Canada. Planes were stranded in Canada um, and we welcomed them into our homes uh, until things could get dealt with in the United States. And, and to be treated by the Trump administration so poorly um, really, I guess, left us with a bad taste. What, what happened from 9-11 to today? And we've seen fundamental changes in the United States, of course. Um, um, and you, you as Americans could probably explain more about that than me. But um, for us as Canadians, we, we're, we're looking for the United States to return back to our, its traditional relationship and we're willing to help. So when you talk about Canada-Japan relations, I think a lot of people outside a, a certain set of specialists don't really know what entails Canada-Japan relations. Could you share some details on what are the key issues with this major bilateral relationship? So I think when we look at the bilateral relations, one of the underpinnings is trade. And I think that Canada and Japan has worked very closely together in terms of promoting um, multilateral trade. And we call that the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. And this is this major deal of 11 countries. Um, it represents about um, uh, six, uh, uh, if I remember the figure right, seven trillion dollars in trade, which is a lot, right? Five hundred million people, seven trillion dollars in trade, um, and it focuses on intellectual property rights, um, environmental law, labor law, and limiting the role role of state on enterprises. So, um, Japan and Canada worked carefully together with other states to kind of promote this pillar of twenty first century trade. So that's a big area. Another area is agriculture, of course. Canada's a big agriculture exporter, and, and Japan consumes a lot of agriculture and energy. Uh, and Japan is is actively trying to seek alternatives, uh, energy sources, and can, Canada has a huge energy reservoir to help them. But there's also other areas, technology, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, that Canada does do a lot of work with Japan. And lastly, I think most um, 
recently is is Prime Minister Trudeau's commitment to something called the Free and Open Indo-Pacific. So it's this initiative that the Japanese have started about since 2017 to focus on the Indo-Pacific region and to focus on something called rules-based order. And basically is making the countries in the region follow rules. And guess what? There's a few countries in the regions that aren't, aren't, aren't following rules and it's going to create problems for the whole region if countries don't follow rules. And um, we see that in the East China Sea with Chinese merchant vessels going in and out of the water uh, waters around the Senkaku Islands. In the South China Sea, we see that around um, uh, China building artificial islands and then militarizing them. And of course, we see weapons proliferation in North Korea. And, and you know, these are all examples of countries not following a rules-based order. Yeah, I think it was sort of a maybe a different interpretation of free and open Indo-Pacific, like, oh, look, free islands, we'll open military bases. That's a good point. I think, uh, yeah, maybe the Chinese could use that next time when they're talking about their position on the South China Sea. But yeah, this free and open Indo-Pacific, I think, is the latest pillar of the bilateral relationship. And of course, um, Japan is on the forefront of leading this kind of initiative and Canada is not going to adopt it outright. There's going to, they're going to have a Canadian approach to the Indo-Pacific. But I think, you know, those are the core areas that we would think about Canada and Japan relations. And the last one, I guess, is, is what we call buttressing inter- international institutions and championing human rights issues. Um, and there's a lot of human rights problems right now in the world, whether it's the re-education camps in Xinjiang, or the national security law in Hong Kong, Um, both Japan and Canada have a lot um, of synergy and and shared views of how to deal with these issues. And the trick is how to create shared policy to solve some of those issues. So as you were mentioning, uh, you know, countries in the region not following the rules, specifically China. Um, You've written a lot about the ongoing shift in defense policy in the Indo-Pacific. What do you think Japan and other countries in the region need to do you know, given this new reality where China is a major military power. So, you know, China is part of the, I think it's the biggest force driving Japan to think about security cooperation in other ways. But let's be frank, um, the past four years um, under the Trump administration is another area of real concern. I think there was real concerns about um, the Trump administration abandoning the Japan-U.S. alliance um, and doing something crazy. And we saw this after the Hanoi summit where um President Trump and um, uh, President Kim uh, met in Hanoi and, and, and he came out of the meeting and said, we're going to uh, withdraw some troops in South Korea. And he did this without consulting the South Koreans. He did this without consulting his own people. And, you know, for the Japanese are worried, right? Mm-hmm. And the Japanese see things like the Trump administration making a request for the Huawei executive. Meng Wanzhou, uh, to arrest her and eventually extradite her to the United States without taking into consideration what could be the boomerang effects for the Canadians. And this week is the second anniversary of Michael Corvig and Michael Spavard um, in being arrested in something called hostage diplomacy. So they were, they were arrested within a week after this um, Chinese executive was arrested. You know, they're sitting in a jail that's not much bigger than a, a four Joe, five Joe, six Joe um, um uh, Japanese room and she's, you know, moving around Vancouver. She can go to pizza hut and have pizza and do whatever she wants. I mean, these are fundamental differences, right? So, um, you know, we, I think we worry about, um, and Japan worries about how to deal with a growing China, but they're also concerned about how to deal with a United States that is perhaps, um, not as reliable as it, it was. And in order to do that, what we see is Japan try to tighten its relationship with the United States but also um, build other strategic partnerships. And we've seen that um, two weeks ago, um, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison visited Japan for one day uh, to sign uh, an agreement towards a defense pact between Japan and Australia. And this defense pact basically allows for something called reciprocal access. It's a reciprocal access agreement. So Australian troops could come here, Japan troops could come and train in Australia. And it's a way to create more synergy between their forces, uh, more interoperability between their forces, and to be able to respond quickly to events in the region. Um, And I think that's really, really critical. And you also see Japan really leading and being on the forefront of promoting initiatives such as the free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And I think that's going to continue. So it's Um, hugging the United States tighter, but also building alternatives to um, deal with the um, fears about China, the concerns about China, but also worries about the United States. 
So you mentioned the hostage diplomacy that's been going on. And more recently, something that I've been watching is what has become the Great Australian Wine War and China's aggressive tit-for-tat trade diplomacy. You know, it kind of reminds me of the Boston Tea Party. Uh, Do you have any uh, comments on what do you think is going to happen with this sort of very divisive way in which China is uh, basically retaliating for things that it sees as antagonistic in its various policies by withdrawing and by making various policies that effectively create tariffs or embargoes on foreign products entering, of course, one of the world's largest economies. So the Chinese have an expression, um, kill the chickens to scare the monkeys. And, you know, you could tell who's the chicken in this particular context is Australia and the monkeys that they want to scare is everybody else. So China views Australia as a very capable actor within the region. It has really strong relations with the United States, uh, very strong relations with Japan. Um, it's, It's a rich country. It's dependent on the Chinese economy. And it, China's view is that they don't want other countries to have such a bold and uh, strong leadership position in pushing back against Chinese assertive behavior in the South China Sea and in the region. They took particular offense to the Australians um, requesting an international investigation to the start of the Corona-19 virus, where I think most um peer-reviewed articles on uh, where the virus came from say it came from Wuhan. It didn't come from Italy or India, these kinds of um, rumors that I think the Chinese government has been peddling overseas. So China's taken the approach that we're going to hit an ally, a smaller partner of the United States, hard and try to set an example so that the Canadians and the Germans and the French and the Japanese and the South Koreans say, "This we don't want this to happen to us. And I assume that's going to continue. But fortunately, I think that other countries have said, we're not going to let Australia deal with this alone. We're going to push back against China collectively. And I think that we're going to see growing uh, consensus of how to do that. And that's going to probably to push back on China in terms of trade, to have reciprocal punitive measures against the Chinese economy. And I wouldn't be surprised if other countries collectively come together and say, if you're going to do this to to Australia, we're going to stop accepting your students, stop accepting your tourists, and potentially ban Communist Party members from traveling abroad. Um, That's the hardest hardest penalty that I think that a collection of countries can do against China, and that will significantly impact the elites in China, and that will eventually probably put pressure on President Xi to tact in a different direction. So no wallaby left behind. No wall will be left behind, right? And that's that's the kind of approach that I think many countries need to take because I think, um, you know, we've all experienced bullying, right? And if you don't stand up to a bully, what happens? Keeps on going. It keeps on going. And I think that um, there's a recognition now that, um, you know, China is pushing back very, very hard against countries and that if we don't collectively um, push back, that it's going to continue, um, going to continue and probably get worse. I I think that this discussion is happening and there are various, you know, news articles and statements that are coming out regarding this. And you've already seen this sort of global campaign to drink Australian wine. And you see sort of isolated things where this is becoming uh, a topic of news interest. But do you think that the, of course, basically the alliance of countries around Australia will actually come to bat? for uh, what's going on and this sort of organized action can actually bring us in a a positive direction? So I think there's great examples. Um, In November, uh, a group of, I can't remember how many countries, I think uh, 14 countries signed something called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. And that is a trading agreement that does include China, um, but it makes the Southeast Asian countries ASEAN be the center of the trading unit. And that allows for more options and it forces countries to try and, uh, you know, have the same rules of trade. Um, With the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, um, we see South Korea voicing interest in it. We see um, Japan saying they're going to actively recruit other countries and work for other countries to come in and form another economic unit. So, you know, it's, it's diversifying your economic portfolio. You can't divorce yourself from the Chinese government. 
and the Chinese economy. But what you can do is you can um, separate yourself a little bit so that you have more trading options. And that's what we see countries doing. And they're going to continue to support these kinds of trade agreements that help uh, not only Australia, but many countries diversify their economies so that they're less reliant on the Chinese economies in, in a negative way, but they can still access it in a positive way. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just a reformulation of the trading relationship. It's not a div- divorce. It's just a rethinking of how the relationship is going to work. So thinking about this shifting dynamic in global power, obviously, I think China already sees that other major democracies are, in, in their eyes, ganging up against them. And I think that they've already, you know, over the past years, developed a strategy to go around that, basically. And I think that the centerpiece of that strategy is One Belt, One Road. Uh, Recently, a colleague and a good friend of mine, Ike Freeman, uh, wrote a book, One Belt, One Road, Chinese Power Meets the World, where he talks about really in depth how the Chinese state has gone into these various developing countries and extended all sorts of different development projects and opportunities that has really expanded the sphere of influence of China uh, across the developing world and in a lot of quickly developing countries that a lot of people think are going to be the future centers of economic progress and also a huge source of revenue for global companies. Obviously, that would go around a lot of the developed nation sort of great wall against China. But do you have any thoughts on what the future of this initiative stands in vis-a-vis the power balance between China and these developed countries? So you're... you're um the BRI is really interesting. And just to give your, your listeners some insight, the BRI has five land corridors and one maritime corridor, and it's called the, the Maritime Silk Road. And these six corridors in total are meant to be infrastructure landlines. And China is advocating and helping emerging countries with their infrastructure development, and that includes building bridges and highways and railways and ports. And the idea here from the Chinese point of view is to replicate their own experience, is that um, China's development over the past 40 years has come from something of, of developing infrastructure to open up the economy. If you develop infra- infrastructure to open up the economy, you can start to move labor in and out of the economy, trade uh, and trade goods. So the view from Beijing is that by building roads for Nepal or building roads for Myanmar or through Pakistan is that on the one hand, you can help those regions develop and you can link them to the biggest consumer market. And that means those countries can sell things to China and that that capital could come back and help them develop. The BRI agreements are non-binding agreements. That means that there's there's no legal uh, requirements on either side. And that's a fundamentally um, distinguishing feature from the infrastructure projects that you know happen with Japan or through a multilateral cooperation uh, between the United States, Australia, Japan, and a, a recipient country. So those are some major features. Now, what does this mean in terms of China's economic security? I think that what it's really trying to do is, is build its own autonomous economy that is linked to other emerging economies and make it less dependent on the developed economies of the United States, of Japan, South Korea, and Europe. Now, how much it can do this is an open question um, because there's still a technology gap. We have huge investment by Western companies in China. So again, it goes back to my previous point about Australia and other countries. You can't divorce from the Chinese economy. All you can do is recalibrate your relationship and reshape it. Um, so that you can continue to engage in it, but at the same time, find other opportunities. And China's doing the same thing. It wants to still continue to engage in the outside world, but based on its own terms. So this is going to create a challenge for um, the Chinese-based uh, economy and the open-based economy. How do you engage? Where are the crosswalks that they engage in? And how do they manage the the regulatory sides of this, the technological sides of this, and the digital economy that's developing in in the Chinese-based economy. And I think that's really, really interesting. And it presents an opportunity for businesses to create that crosswalk 
in terms of technology regulation and other areas, um, but also presents a vulnerability because, you know, you're moving into a system that has fundamentally different rules um, that's, you know, ruled by the party, not ruled by law. And it's going to create a challenge in terms of how we uh, move forward in terms of globalization. So I think we're kind of moving into an era of globalization, not globalization. Globalization sounds slow. <laughs> yes, it's going to be a, a slower way. The, the world's going to just be less integrated moving forward. It's going to be like uh, the middle school prom. Everybody's just slow dancing. <laughs> No, I mean, that's interesting. It makes sense, too, from a technological perspective. I mean, a lot of people think we're becoming more more and more connected, but in actuality, you know, um, we're becoming more and more ingrained in our own bubbles, right, on social media and whatnot, so... Yeah, and that's really interesting, you know. So, like, you know, uh, we have... You probably have Twitter or we, uh, WhatsApp and things like this. So, within the Facebook world or those worlds, you you com- communicate within your, your sphere, right, your bubble, mm-hmm. um, but... For example, I have WeChat, which is the Chinese version of, of, of Twitter or whatever. You know, I'm when as a, a, an outsider, I'm cautious about what I write on it, right? Mm-hmm. And so are my friends. They're cautious. My Chinese friends are cautious about what they write on it. And when I engage in that system, I have to um, alter my behavior and I have to be aware of who's watching and how they're watching and how this will implicate my, my Chinese friends. So, yeah, we're, we're dividing into two digital spheres at least. And there's one digital sphere that I think is going to be more and more difficult to access if you don't read and write Chinese. Um, but also it's going to be difficult to access if you don't understand what is the appropriate, uh, I guess, um, digital behavior mm. so that you don't put your friends in, 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 in jeopardy. Um, and that's going to be increasingly difficult. So, again, I think that globalization is happening and, and the, we're seeing something called, you know, a digital bifurcation, right, into a Chinese digital world and an and open world. Taking this kind of, you know, digital point of view to the, what did we call it? The bifurcation. Bifurcation. Where do you think Japan fits in all of this? Because uh, as you just said, uh, you know, the American Japan Alliance is one of the strongest in the world. But at the same time, we have to consider Chinese technology, which in a lot of ways, uh, you just mentioned WeChat, WeChat, even TikTok. I mean, uh, are really, really advanced uh, from a software developer perspective as well. The editing technology on TikTok, just er- everything that China's coming out with now, they're even making these gigantic games that are uh, taking over the world as well. So I, I wonder where Japan kind of sets in all this. So Japan is concerned. They're concerned because, you know, Japan's biggest trading partner is China. They have a huge manufacturing footprint in China. And that means that their businesses are subject to Chinese laws and they have to negotiate the digital labyrinth there, right? And, you know, from that standpoint, they're going to have to duplicate many of their services for one for the Chinese system and one for an open system. And this costs money, right? But it also opens up doors to, you know, industrial espionage and other forms of espionage, which is is a bit sensitive. And I think that another area that's important is... um, thinking about the recently adopted national security law in Hong Kong. This is not just for Hong Kong, right? It's China at large. And this means that, you know, your businesses are going to have to be very sensitive to um, political issues within the China data sphere. Mm, mm, mm. But the question is, is can China extend that national security law to the non-Chinese data sphere? And this is a real challenge for um, Japan and other businesses. Um, And I think another area which is interesting to be thinking about, um, because this revolves around technology, and I think in the the media you hear a lot about a Cold War. I I don't think we're at a Cold War yet. I think we're at a tech war. Mm. And as that tech war becomes more um, intense, uh, the question is, is what kind of pressures are going to be placed on um, allies of the United States to withdraw from the Chinese tech environment. And that's going to be really difficult um, because uh, if you want to be part of the Chinese economy, you're going to probably have to use the Chinese systems. And um, for countries like Japan, South Korea, uh, and others that have a big footprint in, in, in China, this is going to be a really difficult choice. And I think um, moving forward, I just don't know how they're going to negotiate it. Um, former Prime Minister Abe put forth uh, a policy on data with trust at the Osaka 2019 G20. And that's starting to gather momentum. 
but still, I don't think Japan's found a way to thread that needle yet. So switching gears back to the domestic politics sphere here in Japan, recently it was reported that Prime Minister Suga's popularity has taken a hit from scandals and questions over his administration's handling of the go-to travel campaign and also potential allegations against former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Do you think that Prime Minister Suga should be worried about his political future or are these just growing pains? I, I think in many ways, that's a good point. It's a growing pain. So I think he, he came into power. He was relatively positive. He was following a, a, a prime minister that was losing his political value, at least domestically, very, very quickly. Um, and now he's facing the the brunt of the job. And, you know, we've entered December. I think, um, you know, the number of COVID cases in Tokyo is at 600 a day. The economy is is starting to hurt for some members of, of, of Tokyo and Japan. So I think that's the realities of leadership. He's had a, a honeymoon period, but now I think the the public is starting to put say, you know, you know, you you need to find some good strategies to deal with COVID nineteen for one. I think the you know the the scandals that he's inherited from Prime Minister Abe is an, something that he's going to have to deal with. The question is how how he can deal with it. Um, can he be more transparent? And this is an open question. You know, when he was the um, cabinet secretary, you know, he was known for hide, getting stuff away from the media and controlling the media. So it's questionable if he can be more transparent. Um, and, you know, uh, Japanese politicians aren't really known for their transparency either. The go-to program, that's interesting. Um, so for your listeners, if they don't know what the go-to program, it's a discount system to allow people in Japan to travel to the countryside. To help. Basically, it's, it's kind of an economic subsidy where people from the wealthy urban areas can go and stay in hotels and eat out at restaurants in the in the rural areas and it's meant to inject some currency into those economies so with the increase in in, in covid cases you know there's there's criticism is this uh, the right policy should we be encouraging people where there's a large number of infections daily going to the countryside so i think the criticism is there that you know is this the right thing to do and i think his approach is, is that uh, we need to keep the economy going especially in the rural area and if we don't have people going in and staying at hotels and eating food, that those communities could collapse. I think it's the right decision, but I think that uh, he needs to communicate better. Why, uh, why is he doing, taking the strategy forward? Now, he may not be the best communicator, so that means he needs to find people that can communicate why this is uh, something that's important. Lastly, I think that in general, um, you know, the Japanese public are quite pessimistic about political leaders. Uh, I mean, when was the last, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi was relatively popular for his first year or so, and then his popularity routes fell because of his policies towards China and visiting Yasukuni Shrine. Um, Prime Minister Abe had a bit of a honeymoon period, but him as well, he's he went very, very low in terms of support in the summer. Um, so I think it's following the broader pattern rather than um, an outlier. And if it's not an outlier, then I think Prime Minister Abe just needs to continue to, or Prime Minister uh, Suga needs to continue to be an explainer, uh, find ways to communicate his policies clearly and accrue economic, tangible economic benefits for um, people, not just in the urban communities, but in the rural communities. And of course, deal with COVID. Yeah, that's a really good point. And of course, Prime Minister Suga, before he was Prime Minister, was Chief Cabinet Secretary. And he had quite the reputation of being extremely good at sticking to the talking points. But now, of course, as prime minister, I think the public is also expecting him to be more of a communicator and show some form of transparency as prime minister. From what you've seen so far, do you feel that he is living up to that new expectation or do you think he's still sticking to his same playbook of reading the notes and then saying sayonara? You know, it's. It, it, I think that, you know, when we compare Western politics to um, Japanese politics or Eastern politics in general, you know, the the public face is very cold. It's very stiff. It's very stick to the talking points, right? Because, you know, their viewpoint is that the more you say, the more you have to lose. Um, where in, in Canada, where I'm from or the United States, you know, we're out there. It's the tradition of getting out there and using speech to convince people of, 
you know, why this policy is the right policy for you. So I, I think there's a cultural side here, right? You know, to expect him to go out and be a great communicator in the way that, for example, Angela Merkel was at the height of COVID or other leader, or um, the prime minister from um, Singapore, uh, Prime Minister Lee, to expect that kind of level of transparency and communication, I just think it, it's it's not something that I've seen in my life in Japan uh, from political leaders. So what is the alternative? And that means, you know, having people that can communicate on your behalf that are more effective communicators, or it means policies that are well articulated in venues that the majority of Japanese people consume. So, you know, things like um, NHK, most Japanese people watch NHK when they're dinner. So that's the place to get people that are good spokespeople to talk about your policies, even if it's not you. So I've seen Prime Minister Suga speak at in international forums and he's, he's I, I think the content is okay, but it's pretty wooden. And, uh, you know, he, he sticks to his points and you know, that doesn't play very well in international communities um, or domestic communities. But I think that um, the international community has more space to watch what's happening in terms of real policies, where I think the domestic community is, has, has, you know, they don't see the real policies emerge in the same way as the international domain. Now, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, of course, watching Prime Minister Suga on television seems to be a much more rare occasion than Prime Minister Abe. I think he has definitely not the same thirst for the limelight as his predecessor. And honestly, I think that given the current situation with the pandemic, there's some strategy behind that. But of course, at the same time, it is a fundamentally different style of leadership. And it really is a question how he's going to develop that and also how he's going to utilize the rest of the members of his cabinet who have taken an increasingly public role. I mean, if uh, you weren't told otherwise, you might think uh, Konotaro is the prime minister because you see him on TV all the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a super point. Comparing to former Prime Minister Abe is probably not a good comparison for a couple reasons. Prime Minister ha- Abe had eight years to hone his skills. So the first couple years of his premier sh- second premiership I think he was a bit rusty, but once he, you know, gave up the ideological crap and started to be much more pragmatic, we saw the guy turn into a, a much more effective communicator, at least on the international front. On the domestic front, you know, you're always assailed by accusations and scandals and all these kinds of things. So you have to be a pretty tight lip. But I think he evolved into a much more effective leader. Will Prime Minister Suga have the same eight years? Uh, at this stage, I'd probably um, say no. Prime Minister Abe's tenure is probably an aberration. A second point I wanted to mention, it goes back to the current situation. Is there the avenue to be an, you know, an out in the front public speaker at this moment? And I just don't think there is, right? If you, if you compare to, I think, a, a more effective communicator, um, the Tokyo governor, Koike Yuriko, she's out there, but you know, she's wearing a mask, she's wearing the uniform, and it just doesn't speak to confidence. It, it speaks to fear. And I, and I think that is something that you have to change the environment to present confidence. And I don't think they, they figured out what's the right formula yet. Yeah. So, you know, staying on the uh, topic of the pandemic, apart from your extensive policy work, you're also a professor at International Christian University in Tokyo. So we'd like to know, you know, what has it been like teaching classes during this pandemic has it changed your approach to teaching and what do you think it will be like next year? So um, ICU, the International Christian University, pivoted to online learning right in April, early April. So I think we were probably one of the first universities in Japan to be able to do that. And we had to figure out the technology and we had to figure out the technology on the student side. So the university has all the technology, right? We have the Wi-Fi, we have the environment. But the question was, is, do people at home have the environment and what we found is that um, not all professors have a great um, internet network at home. So if they're using the Zoom system, um, then there's some challenges. And for the student side, this was really interesting because you just don't think about this if you, if you have a good Wi-Fi system. But for the average family, they don't live in a very big place. 
um, and they may not have good Wi-Fi connection. So they're competing for a room to do their class with their brother or their sister or their dad who might be or mom might be doing uh, online work at home. So there's a lot of challenges in terms of negotiating the Wi-Fi environment. In terms of teaching, I think uh, depending on your background, I, I was comfortable with it because I do a lot of online uh, work, whether it's television interviews and other things. But what I thought is that I couldn't connect with students. So we're sitting in a room right now and I can see your expressions. It's really easy. But when you have a panel of 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 students, um, it's hard to get a feel if the students are, are happy, sad, bored, interested. And you need to figure out that technology. And then third is, I think it's our responsibility as, as, as teachers or instructors or our leaders is that we have to not say uh, to students, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't ideal or this isn't the best situation. I think in the approach I took was this is training for the 21st century job workplace. You will do a lot of work online. You'll do more and more things at home. You will need to be familiar with technologies. You'll need to be able to work with people you've never met in groups and get something done. So this is a great opportunity. And when you get out of this program, you'll be able to say, I've done group work remotely. I've done all this stuff remotely. You know, that was the approach I took. And I thought that the students responded to that much better than saying, I'm sorry, this isn't ideal. Um, so there were some area, some challenges I had for the students. So I think that we need to do more. We need to help them more and um, uh, find ways to, so that they can um, socialize with each other. That's probably the, the biggest area I, f- I feel really bad for students because um, in particular in Japan, but in many countries, it's the out of class fun, right? Games, Tokyo, clubs, dating that I think that they've suffered um, during these past six months under the pandemic that we can't replace with Zoom. So we need to find new ways to, uh, you know, have that social component of learning. Yeah. You know, uh, on one of your first points, it's very interesting to me uh, about a lot of these Japanese students and Japanese in general not having uh, high speed internet at home. I, I've been paying about 3000 yen, about, you know, 30 USD a month. Uh, since 2013, and it's extremely high-speed internet. I have you know seven devices on it at the same time. Uh, I've actually you know uh, stress tested it, but I remember when this all started. A lot of my friends who are uh, still in school and whatnot were complaining because they don't have any kind of you know uh, internet contract with NTT or anybody, right? So I guess this is really rampant in Japan. When in the states, you know, like everyone's got uh, some kind of you know internet contract. Yeah. Or, or they, they use their, their phone, only their phone to access the internet and to watch things. Right. And for online learning or business meetings, there's a, the, the phone is a limit, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. The data is very, very, very limited, especially here in Japan. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, just that's ICU, right. And we're, I think we're a premier liberal arts university in Japan with, you know, really, um, not, a, a relatively well off student body, but, Imagine the other universities that don't have the the level of infrastructure and the ability to pivot. So I think there's been a huge impact for some universities. And, you know, I was speaking with um, the former special advisor, the prime minister, Taniguchi Sensei, about this. And he said, this is what one of the areas that Japan really screwed up is we did. We found how we weren't um, as tech savvy and prepared for something like this as we could have been. And as a result, you know, our, some of our citizens have not been, we, we, they've really suffered because they didn't have that environment to c- keep learning and to keep it communicating and to work from home so they're safe in this COVID-19 period. You know, the, the topic of digital transformation has become a huge buzzword in Japan this year for yeah. exactly this reason. And a lot of Japanese firms are starting to realize that the digital transformation they thought they were at the forefront of in reality, you know, everybody's still using fax machines. And when time came that people needed to work from home, a lot of companies quickly found out that they did not have any of the infrastructure or were missing key pieces of the infrastructure necessary to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, and this, I, this is what really worries me about the recovery is that I think that the companies and businesses and universities that pivoted really well, um, they'll have no problem. Um, and, but many didn't, 
And I think that the recovery will be really uneven. Those countries that pivoted well will be able to continue to springboard in terms of profits um, uh, in university education and bringing in students. But those that didn't, how are they going to recover from this? Because they've lost profits. Um, they've probably lost customers, which means they're going to need either more financial aid to just survive or financial aid to upscale their technology, technology environment. And it really bodes ill for, for an even recovery if we don't start to think about those businesses that didn't pivot well. And the question is, how do we help them pivot better? And I don't think we've, I've, we've had those discussions yet. Absolutely right. Well, and also I know recently there have been a lot of issues with uh, students in Japanese universities who are receiving financial assistance in the form of Japanese scholarships uh, actually dropping out because the current scholarship system did not have the necessary policy in place to enable them to continue their studies. And I think beyond that, a major issue with the current Japanese scholarship system is that it's basically a loan. So the students who are, you know, even if they're getting this money and continuing to get the money, it's borrowed money and they're not getting the classes. Obviously, even if they are getting the classes, they're not in person classes. And I think a lot of students who've been placed in this situation are feeling really left out in the cold by the current situation. Uh, I have heard that the ruling coalition led by the LDP is looking to do something to change this. But have you heard anything about the issues facing students right now with the scholarship system? So I think there's a couple areas here, Parker, that you, you've addressed. Is one is the uh, this loan system that's supposed to be a scholarship system, but it's actually a student loan system. So the students are saying that this this is, has no value because we're not in the classroom. So why would we want to take on a loan that um, for something that we're not receiving a service in the way that was intended? The second is the kind of inflexibility of the scholarships. So many of the students uh, that would be on a scholarship. Um, they are challenged in terms of their um, digital environment, and they're to say, "Can I get a can I get a, a Wi-Fi router at home so I can study?" And you know, the limitations of the scholarship suggest that they can't. So you know, there's the 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 side about what kind of education we're getting and is taking on a loan worth doing, and then there's the loan itself or the scholarship itself and the problems with it not representing the realities of of education today. Third, and I think is an interesting um, thing that's happening associated with the pandemic and associated with students and scholarships is that many are saying, I'm going to take a gap year. I'm going to take a leave of absence and see what happens in a year, come back in a year to see if things will be normal. You know, I think that we're seeing increased numbers of students um, taking that gap year. The question is, what do they do during the gap year? In other many countries, the gap year means go abroad or do a part time job or, you know, do peace boat or something like this. But the gap year, unfortunately, is staying at home. And I'm afraid that's going to create more inward looking uh, people, which is not what we're looking for in terms of building a, a Japan that is more dynamic, more versatile, um, that has those skills to pivot. Absolutely right. Well, the last thing I wanted to mention is before we started recording today, you mentioned that you ran into those infamous anti-maskers in Nakameguro of all places. Yeah. And of course, I think we've maybe mentioned this on the podcast before that there are these sort of anti-mask demonstrations going on in Shibuya near the famous Hachiko monument. But I didn't know that they had expanded beyond their uh, original perch. Yeah, so they rotate locations. So I, I went to this group, and it's the Japan Sovereignty Party. And I was I, I saw them, and I saw the sign um, that this is, they called it a, a cluster demo, cluster demonstration, and, and masks don't work, and we're not going to take vaccines, and COVID's a lie. But what's interesting about this group is that it linked a whole bunch of grievances that are really common with far-right parties in Japan. So they first talked about losing Japanese culture, right? So the policies to deal with COVID meant that they couldn't have their traditional gatherings like year-end parties, Boninkai and Shininkai, the New Year's parties, that they couldn't engage in normal relations that are uh, uniquely Japanese, like having a nomikai or karaoke. They also talked about that, you know, the reasons for this is... is um, 
you know, it was quite racial slurs against China, which I, I completely um, don't accept. I think it's really terrible to, to blame China for this. I think the evidence suggests it came from there, but we should not blame the Chinese people whatsoever. It's just um, horrible. But this, this group did this, right? So they were linking all these grievances and the latest grievances, uh, the COVID-19 uh, mask requirements are, are it's, it's fascinating because you, you just don't see this kind of, of behavior in Japan that often. But when you do, it comes in a cluster. How convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. And watching the, the other Japanese, the non-supporters around, they were shocked. And I felt quite comfortable because, you know, there was lots of police around and the police were looking at this and videoing it to make sure that, you know, if something did happen, that they could control the situation pretty quickly. And um, yeah, the police are wearing masks. So, um, you know, it made me feel a little bit uh, much more secure. But, you know, the demonstrators were out there and, and they were putting themselves at risk and, of course, putting all the other people around them at risk as well. No, it's totally wild. I mean, obviously, you know, this is really big in the States right now, but to see this in Japan, it just makes me shake my head like, wow, these guys are everywhere. Yeah, because people here are so cautious, right? Mm. I mean, about health. Um, I mean, we, when you take trains, um, you know, it, around October, people start to wear masks because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to, to to get other people sick, but they don't want to catch, they don't want to get sick. In in the spring, they start wearing masks to avoid um, seasonal pollinosis, right? I mean, they're very considerate about things. Not everybody, but many. And then you see this group that so flagrantly puts other people at risk. It just goes against a lot of the, the common uh, sense that I think many Japanese people have about not causing problems to other people, you know, meiwaku shinai yoni, which I thought was really... Um, that's why I stopped and took photos and, and videos and kind of, uh, you know, thought, wow, this is something uh, worth looking at for a while. For sure. It's a sight to be seen. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just one of those many things that makes this country so fun to live in. You think you've seen it all and then you see anti-maskers in Nakame. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean. Um, and know, leaking I, it to China. <laughs> <laughs> They make us wear the masks. Freedom. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's funny to think about, you know, and, and you probably see this in Tennessee or Alabama, but you don't expect to see it in, 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 in Tokyo. What exactly do you mean by that, boy? <laughs> <laughs> we, had to, we had to bring that in. We had to bring that in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in Florida, we just sick the gators on them, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, in the COVID period, that's probably one of the craziest things I've seen in Japan, right? Um, yeah, just it's flagrant, flagrant, irresponsible. But um, yeah, it, it also, you know, fits in. And, and this is probably something you, you should bring in somebody that talks about right wing politics because uh, it fits in with the right wing political side of, of, of Japan and, and, and it fits into some of their their tropes, um, which is, is also interesting to just think about. Um, and I, when we go to and tr- look at the United States right now, we don't have people. Uh, uh, center left or um, even further left uh, on the anti-vaccine side or the um, anti-mass side. It's it's these more right-wing conservative groups that are thinking like this. So there seems to be something, um, a commonality in, in these more right-leaning uh, political philosophies um, of rejecting you know, COVID-19 dangers and wearing masks, but also some other of their political inclinations. For sure, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if they're being organized on some kind of, you know, Nichan message board, something like that. And is, is Nichan still around? I haven't, I haven't, I haven't. Oh, it's still huge. I haven't oh, spent yeah. much it's time huge. in it. Yeah, it's know? a, it's a great way to get customer feedback if you're uh, managing some kind of software product because people will go on there and say really bad things about whatever you're working complain, on. Complain, <laughs> complain, complain. Yeah. How many times has someone tell, told our company to die today? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, Twitter. Uh, 527 times, sir. <laughs> Twitter, you get the right wing, right wingers on there. And you, I, you know, like when I tweet something and the, they don't like what I say, I get the, you get, you know, a thousand people criticizing me, right? That's fine. But see China, I just don't see that happening. Or when I used to look at it more frequently. Yeah, it's it's very uh, what's the word? Uh, it's it's very divided. You know, you have to be on the right message board, and they'll have message boards uh, dedicated to certain topics and whatnot. But as you were saying, you know, this kind of wave of uh, denial of science and it kind of being centered around 
right wing politics. I mean, we see it in America right now, too. There, there's two other major news organizations that are extremely popular right now because uh, they're all going with the narrative that the uh, uh, election was completely rigged. Right. Well, all the other mainstream media is not. But uh, yeah, I think uh, these blips happen in Japan as well and are a sign of kind of this global wave that we see of uh, right wing politics kind of. I think just two weeks ago, there was a, a, a protest here in Japan with with protesters, Japanese protesters um, saying that the election was rigged. Oh, which I. Yes. I that, did you see that? That yeah, was fascinating. There were some. It's uh Maybe there's some commonality. Don't like masks. Don't like elections. Yeah, the, I, my my friend Jeff Hall at Waseda University, who does right wing politics, he um, he posted some photos, and I thought, wow. And then um, Nakayama uh, Hidetoshi from Keio University also talked about it on the Twitter. We were like, hey, wow, this is really interesting. You know, we have uh, people that are denying the election results here in Japan as well. And, and they're Japanese citizens. It's just, I just, you know, you're wondering what is all these connections? Where do they get the support? It's funny. It like in the Americas, it's like, Oh, this is so sad. But in Japan, it's like, this is really interesting. Wow. <laughs> you know? but, but, you know, for, Fascinating. <laughs> but for Japan, you know, um, all things being said about president Trump, they appreciated his stronger line on China. Absolutely. And, and yeah. you know, they were um, not happy with Obama's, um, the sense of Obama's um, embrace of China or having a softer line on China. So, you know, we would be surprised, and I think many people are surprised, that there are many um, Trump supporters of his foreign policy and harder line on China in Japan. And still, I think there's great concerns about, and this is full circle for our discussion today, um, will President Biden be as hard on China? Will he continue that approach? Um, and I think many Japanese would like that to continue at the policy level, but also the ordinary Tanaka and Suzuki. Um, I think he will, uh, but it will be much more smart, much smarter, much more multilateral, and uh, he'll have a lot more support because he's not a bully. We shall see. Well, uh, in closing, uh, of course, the thing that everybody's talking about, including us this week, is this vaccination. And it looks like Japan is not going to get it first, but once these vaccines come out, of course, maybe they'll come out in the U.S. and Canada long before Japan. But do you intend to get one? Uh, you know, I'm probably not in the the category of people that would be first in line, right? I'm a young guy. I'm pretty healthy. Um, I think my responsibility is to let the older people and the vulnerable people have it first. Um, and that's my plan. And uh if I need to get the vaccine, um, cause I would like to travel again, uh, I will get it. But I think, um, you know, as people living in, in, in Japan or any community, I think we should prioritize those that are vulnerable and those frontline workers first. And, um, after that, if we've dealt with them, then we could probably take it. What about you guys? Well, uh, Tokyo Wave is uh, making a new investment in a really big freezer. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is 70 or 20. Mine is 100. <laughs> Bring out the big guns. I'm all about the vaccine. And uh, there, if you guys heard, they're going to do the uh, the chip in your um, passport. So if you get the vaccine. Chip in the vaccine, chip in the passport. <laughs> Can I get any guac with these chips? Yeah, Brought yeah, to you yeah. by Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for real. I mean, if you, and if you have the chip, uh, supposedly the countries that participate in this program, you will not have to quarantine. Um, this this is an ideal situation. I think it's still being discussed, but I'm all for it. Yeah, me too. You know, I, I'm my job. I usually travel t at least twice a month overseas and sometimes more. And since March, I haven't been anywhere. Right. And to talk to people on the ground, I mean, especially a place like China, if you if you don't in China, you're not talking to people on the ground, you're just not getting any information. So I'm for the chip and the guac and the passport. You know, uh, thinking about this podcast is going to come out right before Christmas, thinking about God, it's probably going to be the first time in a long time that uh, last week we were just talking about how Aaron and I are not going to return to the United States over the holidays. Obviously, you know, I think everyone here is the, the same. So I guess uh, in closing, ho, 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 wear a mask, mess. <laughs> <laughs> With best regards, Tokyo Wave. Yeah. Merry Christmas to everyone. All right.
Yeah, Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show today. You know, it's great to have all to be able to talk like this about many topics and link them all together. And yeah, I, I echo Parker's comment, Merry Maskmas. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for coming on a second time and hopefully we'll be able to rope you in again for a third. Sure. You guys have a great Christmas. Uh, take care. And uh, I look forward to your next show. Hey, listeners, that's right. You, you listener right there. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoyed Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave.